podcast. My name is Dr. Cindy. I'm a naturopathic doctor, a single mother of two beautiful girls, a retreat host, and I am super passionate about supporting families as they bring new life into this reality. I want to ensure that we are imprinting love safety, and trust onto the next generation because I know that the ripple effects of that are far greater than we can even understand. So let's get rid of the fear, the anxiety, and the uncertainty that goes along with the birth process and let's enter a new phase of reality. On today's episode of the podcast, we have Bronwyn Adicho. She is the owner of Balancing Birth to Baby, which is a support company for expecting and new parents that offers prenatal education and doula support in Southern Ontario, Canada. She has been a childbirth and early parenting educator since 2015 and a birth and postpartum doula since 2016. After a difficult birth experience in 2013, she embarked on a journey to become a birthing from within childbirth mentor and spent time in California to further her in-depth training. Bronwyn has been deeply influenced by this program's view of birth as an initiation into parenting and how to examine your fears of birth and parenting. She uses the tools that she has learned in this program within all aspects of her professional career and has developed them into a coaching program to help birthing people prepare for birth and work through a difficult or traumatic birth experience. She has supported more than 100 births and more than 500 families during their early parenting journey. Bronwyn is a single mother of two wonderful kids. She is such a wealth of knowledge and I cannot wait for you guys to hear her journey, hear her perspective and hear what she has to say because she has so much experience and she offers so much value. So let's dive right in. Hello, Bronwyn. Thank you so much for making the time to be on this podcast. Um, just the I've, I've just recorded your introduction, and I think we are so in line with our approach to childbirth and supporting mothers and supporting families, um, especially in those in that actual yeah. event of childbirth, but uh, in the very early days of parenting. So your work is so important. So thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. I'm I'm really excited to chat with you today. Likewise, likewise. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to get started just by letting people know your journey to coming into this work. Mm. Um, so I I mean there's there's the long story and there's the short story, so I'll take the medium road, but I had always been fascinated with birth and, and babies since I was a little girl. Um, I remember being like four and five years old and seeing pregnant women and just being like, there's a baby in there. Like that is like, that's amazing. And just like really kind of being in awe of the whole, that, that, just that fact alone. And, um, I don't think I ever intended, I mean, I I never intended to get into birth work that would, that fascination wasn't a motivation for me career wise until after I had, my daughter, um, she'll be 18 in a couple of weeks. Um, and, um, I had read enough information a few years before she was born, um, about midwifery care. So I knew when my, I mean, he's now my ex-husband, but I knew when we were getting married and talking about having kids, I said, um, my deal breaker is we have to have a midwife. We have to have home birth. And he's like, that's your deal breaker. Like, it's not, you know, some financial thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's like, that's my, like this is, birth is a really important thing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we had a really incredible home birth experience. Um, having worked full-time as a doula for the past seven years, I can look at that experience and, um, I, 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 th- I know how rare it is now. Um, to, to have that, I kind of feel like I won the birth lottery with my first mm-hmm. birth. Um, I had a few days with both of my kids of prodromal labor. So on again, off again, contractions, they were, you know, early labor stuff, they weren't physically demanding, but they were more 
a mental hurdle to kind of let like get through and and they were really annoying and and kind of got me frustrated and stuff but um once my water broke um she was in my arms in about five hours just over five hours later um which is pretty quick for a first baby yeah and um I was just able to I was at home my ex that was there my mom was there we had a midwife backup midwife and um, a student midwife with us and um we lived in this little tiny basement apartment and it just felt really cozy. It was in November and it just felt warm and cozy in there. And I felt very safe and I just was able to focus on my breathing. And I definitely felt like I was in another place. Mm -hmm. Um, Some midwives that I'm friends with will call that planet birth or labor land. And I was definitely there. (laughs) I love that. Um, I um, actually hallucinated things during her labor um it wasn't scary for me it was a very comforting experience um my parents had to put their dog down a few days before I went into labor and the dog was with me I could feel her licking my face I could feel her like sniffing at me her paws on my legs checking me out like she was I could feel her fur brushing up against my arms like throughout the entire birth like she was felt like she was there and um So it was a very, very profound experience for me. And I took that experience and went, oh, so what did I do that was so that made the difference? And so I, you know, here's the list of books I read and here's the yoga I did and here's the meditation I did. And so Mm -hmm. I was just telling everybody in my life, much to the chagrin of some of my friends and I'm (laughs) sure some of my sisters-in-law, all the things that they could do to have this profound birth experience too. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's not what happens <laughs> because we all bring so many parts of ourselves to birth and we bring so much of what's happening in our current life, but also our past into our births. Mm. And safety is such a factor and the way that we live in our bodies is such a factor. And so you can't just, you know, it's it's more than reading and breathing practice I mean those are big 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 key elements but there's a level of you know self-exploration that is involved and and even even then you still may not get the birth that you had hoped for you get Mm -hmm. the birth that sometimes that's the birth that we need to have um it's more my philosophy now Mm so um after that experience, I realized I wanted to do something in the birthing world, was not sure if I wanted to go the midwife route or, um, or go be, become a doula. And um, when my daughter was, I think she was four or five, I found out that a midwifery clinic in our area, um, maybe she's a bit older than that, but a midwifery clinic in our area had just opened and, and I did some volunteer work for them. And then I ended up being hired by them as an, as, as an administrator. And I worked there for five years and it was a really, um, a really positive experience for me um, to really see the ins and outs of midwifery. And it was enough for me to realize what I want to do, the part that makes me passionate, that makes, that I think I can bring um, a lot of skill to is more, not so much the medical piece. And that's, you know, that's not all of midwifery, but it's certainly a primary part of it. And I wanted to fill in the gaps that I was seeing of physical, emotional support, um, you know, sharing information, sharing ways to help people advocate for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and then I got pregnant again. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so my son is almost 10, or sorry, I shouldn't say almost 10, he's 10 and a half. And his birth, I figured, oh, I've got this. Like I've worked at a midwifery clinic for five years, or at that point, I think it was four years. I was like, you know, I, you know, I've, I've, I, I had a great birth with my first experience. Like I, I'll just have a, you know, like I'll have the same birth. Figured it was going to be similar, maybe faster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was at home with midwives, same as my daughter, but it was very, very, very fast, mm-hmm. and um, less than an hour. Mm. And I never, with how quickly it went, I was never able to get into that place that I was in with my daughter because I didn't, everything was happening so quickly with my body. Mm. And it felt like a huge disconnect between my brain and my body. And I'm somebody who lives very much in her body. So that was something I'd never really experienced like that before. 
Mm. Um, and so the healing journey that I went through and working through that birth experience mm. is what spurred me on even more to become a doula and a childbirth educator. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. What a journey you've had to come to the spot that you are, right? You know, it's funny. I, I, the fact that I just said, you know, I have kids that are 18 and 10 or almost 18 and 10 is just astounding to me because I spend so much time teaching classes and talking about when my kids were babies that like, yes, I live with them. I see them every day, but like, what, how did you get so big? Like, this is, you know, like, cause this feels like yesterday for me yeah. because I talk about it so much. And so, yeah, I, I definitely marvel at the journey quite often. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. so interesting that you say um, when it happened so fast, like you weren't able to get into that same space. And yeah. I've, I've heard that from other women who have very fast birth. Yeah. That it's, it's almost like, um, well, sometimes it can be amazing. Um, mm -hmm. but it's almost like something was like, taken away, you know, in some, in some sense or uh, too fast to process in some ways yeah I mean I think the way that I described it at the time and I've continued to describe it this way because I think it's still even with all the healing work that I had done around that birth it still is a very apt description but I felt as though my brain was stuck at a train station and my mm -hmm. body was on the train like you know how you have, I don't know if you've heard about those trains in Japan that are like magnetic and like they go like 600 kilometers an hour like my mm -hmm. body was on that train like barreling yeah. down the tracks and my brain was stuck back at the station going what the heck yeah. yeah and and it was a big disconnect for me um I just wanted it to stop I wanted to stop so I could just catch my breath mm -hmm. and I thought that I was saying the F word. Can, I don't know if you're okay with like swearing, but <laughs> swear. yeah. okay swear. I thought I was just saying fuck over and over again or like sc mm -hmm. screaming it. And my ex-husband had um, filmed like the last five minutes of the birth. Um, and mm -hmm. it took me about six months before I could watch that because I was just so, I didn't know if it would be really triggering for me to see myself in that place and screaming the way that I thought that I was. Mm -hmm. And so I got to a point where I was like, I think it's, a, I, I think I'm at the, the stage where I need to watch this. And I decided, let me watch it with the sound off. So I'm watching and I'm like, okay, well, this, this looks like birth videos that I've seen before. And so then I thought, okay, well, I'm going to slowly turn up the volume. And what was shocking to me was that I never yelled fuck once. At the oh, wow. very end, as I was giving a final push, I was like, just get him the fuck out of me. And my midwife was like, he's right there. And I, they literally took my hands and helped me pull him up onto my mm -hmm. chest. But yeah. I, that was it. I never said it. It was all in my head. Mm -hmm. And that was such a huge aha for me because I think that ta there are times where women look like they're coping well in labor. Mm -hmm. Um, but they can't express what's going on inside themselves, even if they think they are. Yeah. And that can create that in itself could be a textbook, perfect labor, you know, according to a medical standpoint, according to a doula standpoint, like we got her everything that she needed, but like, if she's not able to express herself or thinks that she is, mm -hmm. and she's actually not, that's the source of trauma right there. Yeah. And something so, that needs to be processed. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So my work as a doula and a childbirth educator and, and then going through my own healing journey with my son's birth, I started to develop um, further tools from the, the ones that I worked, worked on for myself, but further tools to help people process their births and recognizing stages of processing, because I think there are different stages we all go through. Yeah. I think so. And I love that you talked about like, it could look like a perfect textbook birth. Yeah. And yet there's, there might be a micro trauma or something that needs mm -hmm. to be processed. Like, um, mm -hmm. it reminds me of my first daughter's birth. Mm -hmm. It was, it couldn't have gone better. And I'm right. so grateful for the experience we had. Um, I did a home birth, uh, a water birth. It was beautiful yeah. I had candles I had essential oils being diffused I had music going on 
Um, and yet afterwards, every, like I could hardly look at the bathtub because every time I looked at it, it was like almost like a reminder of how intense the experience was yeah. for yeah. a while. And, and, and I was okay. And I feel like I did process everything, but like even in your ideal birth experience, there could be like, um, how do I describe it? Like a, you're still not accepting the intensity of the experience. A hundred percent. Yeah, that's how it felt for me. I mean, I, I, I don't think you can light enough candles yeah. or plan enough songs in your playlist to help you handle the intensity that you don't even know is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And I see these beautiful pictures. I mean, I have some of them from my, both my birth experiences of, you know, a tub and like, you know, music going and everything. And, and it doesn't factor in. I mean, they look like really relaxed, serene, spa-like. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't factor in the intensity piece. Yeah, yeah. And I think the intensity piece, this is something that I, um, my training, I did training with a program called Birthing from Within in the US. Mm -hmm. And that's something that they would often talk about, that we come to the end, a threshold. We come to the end of everything we know. And there is nothing in that moment that we couldn't have taken enough classes to prepare us for, for that moment. We come to the end of everything we know. We want to give up. That could be transition. That could also be having to make a really shitty decision in our labors. Mm -hmm. We come to the end of everything we know and it feels really scary. But the thing is, is what we find there is so rich. And that thing that we find, we may not even realize that we have found that until months later. But mm -hmm. that's, that's truly the gift that I think we need to give birth to so that we can parent that child. Hmm. to go super out on my like birth woo with spiritual soapbox here <laughs> I love that area that you're going to but I yeah. want you to to say that sentence again because it's just sinking into me so we have to so we so it's a threshold experience where we are coming to the end of everything that we know mm -hmm. you know like it's like taking that like having to jump off a rock you know, cliff diving, right? Like mm -hmm. we're coming to the end of that cliff and we, we've got to jump. We've got to take a deep dive and we haven't, there's nothing that we can do to prepare ourselves for that moment. Mm -hmm. Nothing in like, enough. yeah, you can't read in, enough books to just, yeah, jump. yeah, <laughs> to, to yeah. like prepare us for that. And, mm -hmm. but what we find in going through that moment is often the gift that we need to parent that child. I and we have to give birth to that. It's like we're giving birth to ourselves as mothers or in, and with subsequent mm -hmm. children, a new variation of mothers mm -hmm. in those moments. But that's the very key that we need to parent that child. Mm. I love that. And I, I feel that like I've had those moments that you're talking yeah. about. And, yeah. and that's the initiation. A hundred percent. Birth is an initiation. Mm -hmm. And we, our culture has gotten away from initiation rituals mm -hmm. um you know all most capitalistic cultures have um we don't do much to recognize puberty as an initiation mm -hmm. we don't you know it's like you got your license you had sex for the first time you got married like those are kind of like these sort of standards around initiation and even the way that we celebrate those can can not actually lift those things up and so the first initiation that we really truly go through now in this society is often birth. Mm -hmm. Unless we've been seeking out that can create that in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that too. We've um, there's no, there's no context to the next phase of our life. Yeah. But birth, if you approach it and you have the guidance and the support, it. It can be that. It is always that. It, but, it is always that. It just may yeah. not look the way that you think it's going to. Yeah. And the, the perspective might not be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going back to what you were saying about seeing your bathtub. Mm -hmm. um, what that made me think of was I remember talking to someone 
after my son was born and I was still really stunned with this birth, like just trying to figure out what the fuck happened. Like, cause in my mind, this was like hours. And then when I looked at my midwife's birth notes, in fact, I don't even think I looked at the, the notes. They said, wow, that was 23 minutes from the time we broke your water. I was four centimeters, went from four centimeters to a baby in my arms in 23 minutes. Wow. And I remember saying this to a friend, like, I just feel really stunned by this experience. I'm trying to figure it out. And, and she said, what? Like you had a home birth with midwives. Mm. And that was a big piece of the puzzle for me, because I think that there's perceptions, especially in the, and I'm going to put air quotes here, but the natural birthing world. Um, and I have a lot of issues with that term. Mm. A baby comes out of your body. It's natural. They're not supposed to stay in there forever. However, okay. you birth is natural. That's my, that's my opinion, whether people like agree that. with that or not. That's <laughs> fine. So with, um, what it made me, what it made me realize though, is that we have this idea of like certain births being like the gold standard and like, it's not it's the, the standard or the, the, the idyllicness of that birth is based on where we gave birth, what interventions were involved, mm -hmm. how we handle the contractions, how calm we were. There's a lot of emphasis on calm I find in the birthing world these days. Like, how do I stay calm? How do I not lose the control? And I tell people that's an illusion. Mm -hmm. You may, you're going to have to go through that intensity. So get rid of the idea of calm. Like if you need to stand on your hospital bed and crow like a chicken to get through a contraction and that gets you through a contraction then fucking do it. You know, <laughs> it doesn't need to be like, you know, lying there silently and, and, and trying to be as quiet as possible. And in fact, we need to get rid of that. That's a manifestation of patriarchy, right? That oh, yeah. we've got to be good girls. We have to be, you know, like we're, we're supposed to be quiet, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let it out. If you feel like yeah. you need to let it out, let it out. Right. Yeah. My mom always talks about how quiet she was in birth. Yeah. And I'm like, you missed out on an opportunity to just vocalize the way your voice has never come out before. And I can understand that though, because with my first birth, I mean, I've already sworn a few times on this podcast. I have a mouth like a trucker. <laughs> um, I, I, I can be a big talker. And my mom and my ex-husband assumed that I'd be swearing up a blue streak, both, both labors. And I never swore with my daughter. I was very, very quiet, but I was off in that labor land place. Mm -hmm. So your mom may have been there. True. Yeah. And I find that people are either their personality on steroids or they're the opposite. Mm. It's usually what I see in labor. Um, but what I was, what I was going to say, going back to this conversation with my friend who was just really shocked that, you know, how, how, how is it possible for me to feel this way, feel traumatized, feel disconnected. And, and like my body was not, you know, feel, I don't even know how to put it into words, feeling like my body was um, not intrinsically working with me on that day. And, and she was like, but you had this home birth with midwives. And that's when I realized that, you know, it's not about the place that we give birth or who we're working with for our birth. It's how we feel about it. Mm -hmm. And so a big exercise that I do with both my doula clients and people I work with around birth coaching, um, if they want to work with me and they're not living in my community, I do offer coaching programs. And um, one of the things I ask them is how do you want to feel? How do you want to feel during, during this experience? Mm -hmm. And then let's take a deep dive into those words because, you know, uh, two that I hear often is calm and empowered. Okay. I'm like, okay. So what's, what does that look like to you? What is, let's, my version of calm could be very different. My version of calm is nobody's in my house. It's totally quiet. And I'm sitting on my couch drinking a cup of tea. <laughs> like. <laughs> sounds amazing. <laughs> sounds amazing as a mom, right? <laughs> and, and, and like that may not be their idea of calm. So what does calm look like to them? What does empowered look like? Let's take a deep dive into those words. Mm -hmm. And then let's not just stop there. Let's look at what can be offered up in birth, both circumstances and interventions and, and have a little, like start to explore, how could I feel empowered if I ended up with an epidural? How could I feel empowered if I had a really fast birth and gave birth at home? even though the hospital is my ideal birthplace. Like mm. how could I make 
a C-section feel empowering when it's the thing that scares me the most. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that we, we don't talk about enough is how we want to feel in this experience and, and exploring ways that we could make ourselves help, help ourselves feel that way. And our, our support people can help us feel that way too. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a perspective shift than what is in the current zeitgeist in the birthing community. Yeah. Um, and, and it's so powerful because I recently um, hosted a retreat and one of the women who is a good friend of mine, she had a traumatic emergency C-section with her first daughter. And uh -huh. so with her second delivery, her goal was to have a quote unquote, you know, empowered experience uh -huh. um, in the hospital still, just in case something happened. Um, but she really wanted to have a vaginal birth after C-section, a VBAC. Yeah. And, um, and, but the fear of that initial experience was so strong. And, uh, you know, ideally in her mind, she would have had a home water birth, but because yeah. of the fear, she wanted to make sure she was uh, in the hospital. Stay safe. Yep, for sure. And, uh, and my co-host, Natalie from, uh, She's on Instagram at New Earth Natalie. She was like, forget about the environment. That's all the fluff and stuff. Yeah. What's important for you is the connection to your daughter, to your baby girl. Mm -hmm. And she just said, I see that connection so strongly for you. She's going to come out. She's going to lay on your chest and you're going to feel so connected. And, um, and I could just feel the shift happen right there that's really that's 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 the thing that's the most important yeah. yeah is the connection you have with this baby oh I love that yeah absolutely I had um in my prodromal labor experience with my daughter um the night before I actually went into active labor finally and my water broke I had this experience where I started having contractions again and I'd been bugging my family my midwife all weekend th thinking that things were starting and then they would die off and stuff and so I thought I'm not waking anybody up I'm I'm gonna let them sleep who knows if this is even the real thing so I went and sat in the bathroom by myself and honestly Cindy I don't know how long I was there it could have been you know 20 minutes it could have been a couple of hours yeah. time had no relation to the experience and mm -hmm. I just sat there kind of rocking back and forth and that was probably a really great place to be to help me dilate more and mm -hmm. I just talked to her and and it was it it was really stepping into a lot of mother instincts that I don't know if I would have had that conversation with my baby six, at six months pregnant mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. what came to me was this sort of image in my mind of me and my baby being on a bridge and that we were both at either ends of the bridge and this birth journey was about bringing us together in the middle and then we continue on together. Right. And so I just kept talking to her about like, I'm afraid to make that first step on the bridge. I know you are too, because you keep getting the contractions to start and then they stop again. Mm -hmm. We're both feeling afraid, but we're actually doing this together. And then as I kept saying this, the contractions were getting more and more intense. And it's, that is a piece in all of this that we just don't explore. Mm -hmm at mm -hmm. all to the degree that we could be yeah absolutely I always one of the say, things like, that I sorry go ahead no it's okay um yeah go ahead go ahead you go one of the things that I was um I really liked about the training that I did in the states and I mean this is going back um 10 eight to ten years ago that I was um doing my certification over a few years with birthing from within but they, what I really liked is they said, you know, most of the time we look, if we're looking at our focus on birth as a pie graph, like standard classes, care providers, it's like 90% medical and then 10% mom. And then after baby's out, it's 90% medical and 10% baby. And like maybe, maybe a little sliver for the mom. And like partner is lost in all of that and so mm -hmm. the birth lens that they really tried to train from was let's take that pie graph and divide it into four and one quadrant is medical and one quadrant is mom and one quadrant is partner and one quadrant is actually baby mm -hmm. what are babies that. experiencing as they're going through this mm -hmm. and trying to bring that connection more to the forefront yeah yeah we don't talk about the baby's role in the birth process right 
<laughs> even though they're doing a lot of work that day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's one of my, oh, I mean, I get really jazzed about certain birth facts, but one of the things <laughs> that makes me, oh yeah, I'm a total birth nerd. Like, there's my like pile of books behind me, but one of the things that I get really excited about is how babies have these natural instincts to move through the pelvis in this spiral type of shape and 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 are twisting themselves kind of like a corkscrew mm. so that their head can then fit through the pelvis and then their shoulders can then fit through the pelvis they have to move in this kind of spiral and most babies have the instinct to move in a clockwise direction so from like yeah. the right side of mom to the left side of mom sort of going along her back mm. and how they know to do that is just truly incredible to me I mean, they, they're doing things in utero to practice getting ready for birth when it's time to push and, um, early pushing, we don't see much of baby's head because baby's kind of rocking back and forth to get up and around the pubic bone. Well, they actually practice that rocking back and forth. It's kind of a yoga cobra move. They're practicing that in utero to be, to get ready to be born. Wow. That's so incredible. So they're an intrinsic part of the process and, and we really miss out on the richness of that in the way that birth is portrayed and explored in our culture. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's forgotten for the most part. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. I always say that birth is like a dance between mom and baby. Mm -hmm. um, like you're working together. So yeah. when, when mom is confined physically, it's very mm -hmm. hard for her to communicate with baby, to move with baby, yeah. to, to, to create that kind of partnership, that teamwork, that dance. And um, I mean, it's still possible. Lots of women give birth in a static position, but um, yeah. I think when we're able to tune into those instincts, like how does your body want to move maybe in ways that it's never moved before and allowing yourself the comfort yeah. to move that way is is really crucial yeah I mean I talk about this a lot in all of the like it's included in almost all of our class curriculums about optimal fetal positioning and that you know if my hands are like the outside of the pelvis the hips like we're if we're shifting this way there's going to be more diameter to it we're shifting that way there's more diameter to it so a lot of women as contractions get more intense will naturally start to move in a circle or moving their hips around and like Sometimes I've mimicked this when my daughter was a younger teenager, she'd be like, mom, why are we teaching all these uh, pregnant women how to twerk? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but it's like that we're, it, it, there's a purpose to that. Like, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And it reminds me too of just like um, how we've evolved, how music plays an integral part of our, of our being, of our, of our culture. Um, and it's like, it's that rhythm. Yeah. Like it's so important. So, so practicing that rhythm, connecting to, to whatever music mo moves you throughout your pregnancy, I think is yeah. going to be beneficial and just at the very least pleasurable because dancing is fun, right? Releases some oxytocin, some endorphins. There you go. <laughs> yeah. 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 Natural dopamine. Yeah, totally all the things yeah. and it's, it's part of that partnership like you're describing the baby moving in a corkscrew that spiral and yeah. then we naturally want to move in a spiral like yeah. you're moving together you're dancing together yeah um there have been times in my life where I um have gotten really into painting and I mean not anything that I would sell in a gallery by any means it's been more like art therapy for me but one of the things that I've always drawn has been spirals like if I was doing intuitive painting exercises, it would be spirals. And I was like, why, why, like, why do I always do this? Mm. I have a spiral tattoo. Like it's just something. And then when I learned how babies move, I was like, there you go. It's something innate in us. You know, yeah. when I look at sacred geometry, I'm like, well, it's all, like, this is, it's coming from birth. Yeah. 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 So interesting. I've never connected right. the sacred geometry and birth part. And then I think of spirals just in nature, like it's, you know, the double helix of the DNA and then the yeah. way the, the way the universe is spiraling constantly and just yeah. like opening this expansion. It's this yeah. innate thing around us. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and birth is plays into that in a big way. Yeah. Yeah.
absolutely so cool i'm so enjoying your your perspective on things um thank you yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to talk about uh, listening to your intuition mm. as women going into, like, throughout your pregnancy, but specifically around the birth experience. Um, absolutely. I feel like your our intuition is a muscle, yeah. and the more that we listen to it, the more we're going to hear it. Um, when I talk to clients about hearing how they hear their intuition in my personal experience and in most people sharing with me their experiences I think there's sort of three kind of main ways that we will he hear it um and one is a voice in our head and so the example I give is I'm a bit of a speed demon when I drive <laughs> <laughs> and uh I learned pretty quickly to listen to that intuition because when I was in my 20s and speeding I'd have this voice in my head that would say there's a cop just around the corner Mm -hmm. And my immediate reaction, and it was this quiet voice, but a calm voice. Hey, there's a cop just around the corner. Slow down. And I'd be like, no, there isn't. And then like, woo, 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 like I'm getting pulled over. So that happened three times over a couple of years. And I was like, okay, I have to stop refuting this voice. And, and, you know, this voice is correct every time. Yeah. Um, so I listened to that voice. I talk to that voice as part of my meditation practice, not during meditation, but when I do, I do a lot of intuitive journaling after I'm done meditating every morning yeah. and I just ask it questions and listen for the answer. Um, I think it also can come across as a physical sensation, um, but it's so that can be harder if people are dealing with anxiety because anxiety can often come across as physical sensation. So like butterflies in your tummy, I used to think that was instinct. I actually now know it's me feeling like super excited or, and or super nervous about something. And it's all kind of like, that feeling is all kind of congregating there. Mm -hmm. um, I've had other clients who've talked about feeling it in their heart, but sometimes we can also, if we struggle with anxiety, we can also get feelings in our heart with anxiety. So if any listeners are struggling with that, one of the ways that I identify my intuition as a physical feeling is that once I pay attention to it, it stops. Anxiety continues that sensation. Okay, that's a good distinction. Yeah, so trying to kind of use that as a bit of a guide to help you. Mm -hmm. And then the third way that I find people often know their instincts is not so much it comes to them as a physical feeling or a thought, but somebody says something or they read something and they're just, they just, they know that. They're like, I don't know how I know that. I don't re recall ever having that knowledge or ever learning that, but I know that. I know that I know that. Mm -hmm. So it's like a deep gnosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think really important for both par parents to be paying attention to that in the pregnancy period. Mm -hmm. Yes, that can help you in birth, but parenting lasts a lot longer and it's going to help you in parenting too. And we need those skills to help us. For in sure. For yeah. sure. Birth is actually literally just the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and, and following my instincts is how I've known if like something's a really big deal or not, you know, or, or, you know, maybe there's a part of me that's feeling anxious, feeling like this is a big deal. And then when I check in with my instincts, whether it's for my kid or something in my business or what have you, and then it's like, actually, no, no, this is, this is my anxiety going off. This is not. And then I'm like, okay, that's fine. Or, or maybe it's the opposite. I'm feeling like it's not a big deal. And my instincts are like, actually, you need to pay more attention here. You need to ask this question or you need to check in on your kid over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like, it sounds like it's taking the time to, or like making the space to actually listen to that voice. Yeah. So after meditation, doing some journaling or just tuning yeah. in somehow. Um, and I think I really meditation is actually just even that on its own. If people aren't big into journaling, I think just having, you know, five minutes a day where we're trying to not get rid of our thoughts, but have space in between them. Mm -hmm. so it's not this like parade <laughs> constantly yeah. but it's more like little clouds in the sky on a beautiful day and there's lots of room and lots of sky in between each of those little fluffy clouds yeah we have more space in between yeah yeah I like that too and that the distance as well like you're watching the clouds you're you're not the clouds exactly 
-hmm. My son had a really great teacher a few years ago, and he came home with this picture that um, he had colored in um, of all these fish inside a fishbowl. And I was like, oh, this is cute. And he's like, yeah, it actually means something, mom. He was like in grade three or something. And I was like, oh, what does it mean? And he said, well, each of these fish is your emotions. You know, like this one might be sadness and this one might be anger and this one might be, you know, loneliness or whatever. He's just naming different mm -hmm. things. Off. And I said, okay. And he said, and the, the container that's holding the fish, the fish tank is our, is our, is our brains. But what we are is the water around the fish. Oh, so interesting. And I was like, oh, dude, <laughs> I like your teacher. <laughs> beyond his time yeah yeah he's 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 something else that kid he gets yeah he gets a lot of these really big concepts it's really interesting yeah yeah that's so cool that he could portray it in art form as well yeah yeah so I've used that fish bowl metaphor with in parenting but also with clients in the past too like because sometimes especially when we're gearing up for birth our fears can really take over and they become this huge neon sign and we're not actually able to even define the fear. We're not able to see what's on the other side of the fear because it's just so big in front of us. Whereas if we can scale that down and be like, the fear is just like a little tiny goldfish in a goldfish bowl, we're mm -hmm. able to see a lot more perspective, but then we're able to be in touch with our instincts mm -hmm. and figure out what we need to be doing instead of the fear dictating. Yeah, I like that. And then looking at the fear as one of the fish in the fishbowl exactly exactly yeah. it's not all the fish it's just mm -hmm. one it's just one factor yeah yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Great. and it's, it's not controlling it's not controlling the the, the show you know it doesn't yeah. need to yeah 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 because it's hard like we're there's a lot of talk about um releasing the fear or like staying calm as you as you described right yeah. but but it's it's very difficult like it's um if the fear is there, you can't just ignore it. Like, what's your advice to um, to your clients going into the birthing process if they experience fear? Absolutely. Um, and I don't know a birthing person who doesn't ex who hasn't experienced fear. Yeah. If they say that they don't have any fears, they're lying to themselves. Mm -hmm. I, we cannot go through something so monumentous and so profound without having some trepidation or some fear around it. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I want to do is explore that with them. What exactly is it that you're afraid of? And then, okay, let's take it from two places. Let's take it from, like, let's say uh, they heard a really terrible story from one of their best friends about an epidural gone wrong. And they're just, they're, they're desperately afraid that they're going to need an epidural because the pain's going to be more too much for them. And then they're also really afraid that they're going to have the same experience that their friend did. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's take it from going back to the kind of that quadrant that I talked about. Let's give it the medical piece right now. Let's look at the stats of how often does that happen? And maybe I know those stats. Maybe I can say from my experiences, I mean, at this point I've been to, I don't know, 125 births. I've lost count. Mm -hmm. I can say from my own experience as a doula for the last seven years, or I'm actually, and, or I'm looking up stats for them to say like, this is how often that this could happen. So the chances that it could happen to you could still happen, but not super great. Like not mm -hmm. like, so like, let's maybe just try and get that in perspective right there that, that what that could be. Okay. And then the other piece is let's look at your tools that you already have. If that happens, what are the tools that you have that we can use to deal with it? What are the tools we need to develop? Okay. Um, so uh, an example I've come up with with people is especially if they're worried that they're not going to be able to express themselves in labor is let's come up with a safe word mm. so if they say I mean I actually had a client once who said Tony the tiger I'm, a, I'm the, we're in a prenatal <laughs> Tony the tiger she's like I don't even eat that cereal I'm Tony the tiger I was like okay awesome so I wrote Tony the tiger down and at one point she looked at me and her husband she goes Tony during a contraction like she couldn't even say the whole thing and the nurse looks at us and she goes that's not your name to the husband who's she talking about <laughs> yeah 
So I was like, no, that's her safe word. Like, okay. So we knew, we knew if she said that, that that meant she was freaking out about one particular thing or, okay. or like one particular area of birth that had, she'd expressed as a fear. And mm -hmm. it was sort of like a stop and drop. Like we all have to just like, everything has to go to what her support needs to be right now to help okay. her figure out what's going on. And she can, she can indicate what she needs at that time. Yeah. If she's able to, or we can at least make suggestions. Okay. Yeah. And she can say yes or no or yeah or shake her head yes or no or whatever yeah okay. yeah I like that you say that because we often can't speak oh birth. <laughs> it's a, that's a huge thing yeah and and I think that in itself um I mean I shared my story but I I think with other clients I've worked with that in itself has been a huge part of their um trauma or their post-birth processing has mm -hmm. been, you know, here I am, I'm a successful, I have a successful career, I facilitate, I have a voice, I lead meetings, I am public speaker, like I, 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 I'm connected to a voice, I have mm -hmm. my voice, I use my voice, and yet in my labor, I couldn't talk. Mm -hmm. And so it's something I, I talk about with clients preemptively, um, around advocacy, especially, because depending on the dynamics in the couple, if she's the one who has more of the voice and he's more of, the, he doesn't, he, she's the one who does the talking. She's the one who does the, the questions The you know, if they need an estimate on getting the roof done, she's the one making the calls and asking the questions. We have to flip that in the partnership before mm -hmm. the birth, because she may not be able to ask those questions. And, and, and I'm going to say 90% chance she's not going to be able to ask those questions, depending on where things are happening in her labor. So the partner has to take that role on and stepping up to that plate to be able to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. So um, depending on the dynamics of the couple, I've often done the role playing around that. Yeah. So, and, and like before the birth, so it's yeah, not, just like, absolutely. when we go into labor, you're going to be the one talking, yeah. but then there's no, yeah. there's no like skill in that. Yeah. So, so let's develop that. What, what yeah. are some questions you could have? And one of the things, like we come up with a list of questions and then I'll tell the dad, take a picture of that, have it on your phone. Mm -hmm. So if you, if they go into kind of a freeze or kind of a, and, and even if they are a person who doesn't normally freeze, they normally have their voice. When we're dealing with something as vulnerable as birth and about the person that they love most in the world, about to give birth to the next person they're going to love most in the world, they often can go into freeze without that being something that they've ever experienced before. Right. So let's have a list of questions so that if you if you run into that, you know what to ask. Mm -hmm. And we can use that as a guide in those moments. Yeah, yeah, to at least have a reference. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you find uh, couples often want you to be that advocate? that voice yes for sure and I am um my scope as a doula and different doula organizations um can see this differently but most of the doula organizations out there or doula training programs I should say out there um there the feeling is that we are there as a support we're not there um and we can help with advocacy questions but we're not there to give the final decision okay so you know, if I have a client, let's say episiotomy, for example, if I have a client who, you know, has said, I don't want an episiotomy under any circumstances, and we have a situation where an episiotomy is actually needed, I would never in a million years turn to that care provider and say, well, there's no way you can do that. That's not part of our birth plan because, well, maybe we're past the point of birth plan and we need to, this episiotomy could be life-saving. Mm -hmm instead what I would do is turning to the client and saying like hey we're seeing this and this and this this may be requiring an episiotomy giving you a preemptive heads up let's talk to the care provider right now about what that could look like so we can have that conversation preemptively okay yeah and at um, least they have you to support them yeah. That process. yeah 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 um if you're if you're comfortable I want to switch gears a little bit sure um, to, to leaning into discomfort. Mm. So I think this is, um, this is like a key to that initiation in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I just want to hear your, your perspective on that. I mean, I think that's why I chose home birth for myself. Mm. Um, I wanted to see 
um, you know, there's, there's so few occasions in our lives where we are dealing with pain that actually truly has a purpose. You know, if we break our, our arm, we're getting a cast out of it. We're not getting a baby. Right. And so I wanted to see what I could handle. And I also had this intrinsic belief that our bodies were made for this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me leaning into in my own birth experiences, leaning into discomfort was, um, something I was trying to actively embrace. And I think that that is a big part of what gets missed in the discussion. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the richest parts of birth for me, both in my personal experiences and in supporting other people. Um, what's coming up for me instinctively right now is wanting to talk about loss of control too, because I hear both. I'm really scared about the pain and I'm also scared of losing control. Mm -hmm. Um, we live in this society where we're very logical. We're in this logical place in our brains all the time. Our right brain kind of gets lost in the sauce, even though that's probably the place where most of our imagination and most of the richness of our lives gets created. Mm -hmm. um, and if we have pathways that we can get to that right brain place, then we can often handle discomfort. That's where we're getting into labor land in labor. The right side of the brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we can get into that right brain place. And it so is a creative process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um so I love that you brought up dancing because I think that that can be a way to access that right brain place. Um painting I mentioned for me, that can be another way for me to get into that place. Um having some activities, meditation is another one. And mm -hmm. then the third one or the fourth one I should say um, and I often bring this up in classes because I'll say to people, especially when they bring up the fear of fear of control. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, first of all, control is a fucking illusion. Yeah. <laughs> we can't buy our way to control as much as capitalism and marketing and our society makes us want to think we can. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to figure out ways to embrace lack of control. And I'll say to them, there's something that we do if you're in a partnership, I would assume at least once a month, if not more, where you're losing control all the time. And people mm -hmm. are looking at me kind of funny, like, oh, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about, Cindy? Yeah. What yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have an orgasm. Or have an orgasm. <laughs> I was like, when we get our period. <laughs> no, I mean, we can't yeah. control that. That's a good, that's a good perspective yeah. for sure. But <laughs> having an orgasm is we like, if we can't think our way to an orgasm, right? We, no. we need to let our bodies take over. And birth is the same way, except it's a pain thing, but it's all happening in the same part of the body. So if a woman is having more orgasms during her pregnancy, she's building up some of those neural pathways in some of those places to let her body take over and let her brain take a back seat. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're then able to lean, lean into discomfort and lean into that loss of control. So it's like that muscle that you described, like having those pathways already ingrained yeah. a little bit so yeah. that we, we know what to do when birth actually happens. Yeah. It's not like we're trying to do everything from scratch. Exactly. Yeah. And I think a big part of it is too, in our preparation is recognizing that we have some of these innate tools and skills already. We just haven't used them in this realm before. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to develop tools and skills to get us through the first time we moved out of the house when we first moved into our partner you know with our partner like we we, we developed tools and skills when we you know our first job interview mm -hmm. even though we were nervous we did it anyways right we leaned into discomfort yeah it wasn't physical but we we developed things to do that mm -hmm. we developed resilience yeah. and it, it's all the same it's just under a different umbrella yeah and having having the perspective that this this discomfort is for a purpose yeah every every intensity wave surge contraction is bringing your baby and you closer to meeting each other on that bridge that you described yeah and yeah. and if you even have just that visualization it might make um coping with that 
a little bit more feasible. I think another thing around leaning into discomfort, and I often say this into labor, is I'll say, welcome. Welcome each new sensation. Mm. Each new sensation you're feeling is leading you closer to your baby. Mm -hmm. So how I talked about fear earlier, how it can be like this big boulder, big, you know, box in front of us where we can't see anything beyond that or around that. And so it takes over in our thinking patterns and the way that we're preparing. I think pain can be kind of the same thing, this concept of pain. And so we feel a sensation and we're like, oh my God, that hurts. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, let's get curious about it. Let's welcome it. Where does it hurt? Is that, is that sensation? um, What kind of sensation is it? Is it stable? Does it come and go? Is it a throbbing? Is it building up higher and higher and then coming down? Um, You know, is it consistent? Let's get, is it stable? Is it in just one part of our body or is it kind of shifting around? Let's get Mm -hmm. curious about it. And so if we are struggling to get out of our brains, asking our brains questions instead of just getting stuck in that fear, that, that pain fears is also going to help us be able to lean into discomfort. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. I wonder if, um, like at the retreat I hosted, we did a cold immersion. It wasn't mm. ice cold, but yeah. we did cold immersion because I wanted the women to experience a, like an unexpected intensity. Like they know they're going cold water, but like saying it and thinking about it is very different than feeling it. 100%. And yeah. so once you go into and you experience your body react to the cold, to the temperature, it's like instead of going, <gasps> And, and going into fear right away, we practice feeling the cold and allowing your body to adjust to it. And it's like that muscle that you're talking about. Yeah. It makes a big difference. Yeah. It makes a big difference. One of the things that I um, do, we don't have time to do it in all of the classes that my business offers, but we do do it in some. And then we also do it with all of our birth doula clients is have them hold ice for a minute. Mm. Uh, and not just once, several times, like we end up, it ends up being an activity that's about 20 to 30 minutes long of them holding ice for a minute, dropping it for a minute, holding for a minute, because the length of a contraction is a minute. Mm-hmm. Now, ice is not going to be the same thing, just as getting into the immersion that you just talked about isn't going to be exactly the same thing. But where it's similar is that it's an uncomfortable feeling that you cannot get away from in your body that's mm-hmm. triggering things in your mind, just the same way a contraction would. Yeah. And then so it's a great way. Yeah, exactly. It's a great way to see where's your resistance? Where's your openness to this? Mm -hmm. Can give us a little map as to, yeah, what to work on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, And that that's like calling in that surrender. Yeah. That letting go. Yeah. Because there's no control. It's just an illusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's you know, our our brains want to drive the bus. And for the most part, you know, they want to drive the car, they know how to drive the car. And for the most part, that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Um, But for birth, we need to let our bodies drive the bus, we need to let them drive, let them drive the car and our brains need to be at the very back of the bus. Yeah, the body's turn. Yeah, for sure. The body's turn. (laughs) Because the body knows how to give birth, the brain, I mean, and and I don't want to say that as a Pollyanna statement or a toxic birth positivity statement, because there are certainly times where that's not actually true for some people or some birth experiences where that doesn't, me taking, making that statement doesn't take into account other factors that can contribute to needing a a C-section or other interventions. So I just want to put that caveat out there, but Mm -hmm. you know, our bodies do know how to birth, our brains don't go. And so they're going to question it and then they get caught into all of the tangle of pain and fear and tension. And yeah. 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 I agree. Absolutely. I feel like we could speak for hours about birth. But yeah, <laughs> um, we both have to go and pick up our kids in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. After yeah. after school is uh, beckoning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I did want to ask you one question before we head off because for, sure. um, for me, I just really feel like that that first moment we're imprinting something profound onto our babies, onto mm. the next generation, and mm-hmm. and the work that I'm doing is to shift that imprint to love and trust and safety. Um, No matter what the environment is, hospital, home birth, like who cares? 
my friend Rowena will say jungle elevator, like wherever, you know, and, <laughs> um, but I really want that imprint to, to shift towards something. So, and I don't even know what the ripple effects of that will be on the next generation. If most mothers and most families are supported the way that they need to be. Yeah. Um, and I just feel like a lot of the time we're imprinting um, fear and not, not a feeling of safe mistrust and I don't know uh, mm. I know that's not permanent but um, yeah. I just think it might prime us for anxiety for stress for for some of our life um, and so I ask you the question now if you were to imprint something onto the listeners right the women the or the birthing people who uh, might have a little one in their belly or maybe a newborn near them yeah. and there's lots of ears listening what would you like to imprint hmm. you know what's coming to me right now as you share this or as you said all of that and that was so beautiful was a birth I had last November it's the only birth I've had where um I ended up delivering the baby wow um, because the midwife was in a snowstorm and didn't make it to them and on time. And she was talking us through everything on the phone, but it was the dad and I that delivered the baby together. Mm. And um, it was a very nerve wracking experience for me. <laughs> it mm. definitely confirmed that me being in the doula lane is where I'm supposed to be. I don't want to be a midwife for sure. A hundred percent, hundred hundred 150% know that now. Um <laughs> But what happened afterwards, um, so once the baby was out, um, the midwife didn't want us to move the mom too far in case the placenta delivered and there was a bleed. And she said, I'm, I'm 15, 20 minutes away. So we were sitting on their bathroom floor and um, we got her some blankets and, and pillows to sit on for the mom and kind of wrapped her and baby up. And I was helping to hold baby because she was, the mom was very shaky. Mm. And the way I was holding baby was kind of like a football hold where so baby was head was kind of like baby's body was kind of sort of running along the side of the mom's body. And her, the baby's face was very close to the mother's breast. And it was this beautiful 15 minutes. It was very profound for me. Um, because, um, you know, there wasn't them doing the APGARs and there wasn't doing the vitals and there wasn't trying to work on getting the placenta delivered. We just had this truly quiet, connected moment. And I took some pictures as I'm holding, helping to hold the baby with one hand, I had my camera out and, you know, this baby's looking up at her parents and the parents are looking down at the baby. And then within, this was like within five minutes of this baby being born, she literally just leaned her head forward and latched herself on her mother's breast. It's so beautiful. And it was so gorgeous. And I just thought, well, this is how it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That um, and 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 that is again going back to that medical piece of the pie. All of those things I just mentioned that happen right away, those are important. Mm -hmm. But it, it's also what I talked about feelings. The feelings are important too. And so I think to imprint that it's it's holding on to our babies, it's doing as much as we can while they're skin to skin. But also if we just went through something really rough and intense and we need to take a breath, let's have the dad hold baby and do skin to skin for a few minutes. Like this baby's intrinsically connected to both of us. Dad can be doing skin to skin while the birthing person's just like, oh, okay, now yeah. I'm ready. Now I'm ready to meet my baby. I just needed to kind of collect myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So giving yourself the space and time. Yeah. And I think also, I loved how you said that, you know, we don't want, you, you want to try and change or minimize that imprint of some of the baby's first and parents' first experiences of parenthood being so stressful. I think if it is stressful too, it's also forgiving ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that there are circumstances that, you know, beyond our control that created those things that may have been the most important things we needed on that really big day or those big momentous moments. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can do bonding with our babies once they're out, the more that's going to alleviate or balance out that initial imprint if it was a stressful one. Yeah, um, absolutely. I like skin to skin is that. huge. 
that's a huge, like every day, yeah. as much as you can for months on end, yeah. especially if, you know, it was a tough birth for either you or your baby. Yeah. I also like that you said, like, we don't always get the birth that we want, but we get the birth that we need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I say need, it is on so many different definitions of that word. Maybe it was a, the birth that we physically needed to have, mm -hmm. you know, there, it just, for whatever reason, this baby was not going to be vaginally delivered. And so the C-section was needed. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was the birth we needed to emotionally have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Your work is so profound and you're, you're literally welcoming new life into this world all the time, supporting parents when they're at their most vulnerable, supporting birthing people when they're at their most vulnerable. Um, so I just have so much gratitude to you for coming on and sharing your wisdom, sharing your experience. Like I said, we can talk for hours about this. We totally um, could. <laughs> but then our kids would be stuck at school. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to link up your website. Mm -hmm. Thank baby. you. Baby.com. Yeah. And I know that there's tons of resources there. Um, mm -hmm. and you're also supporting parents as a, as a doula as well. Um, is there anything else you'd like people to know before we head off, how they could reach you or anything? Yeah. Um, I mean, they can certainly, if they live outside of where I usually sort of support is like Stratford, Guelph, Waterloo region is primary support area. Um, if they want to work with me or are interested in what that looks like, if they live outside of this area, um, certainly they can check out the coaching tab on my website because there's some options there. So. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. We'll link that all up and me and you are going to stay connected and maybe we'll do. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. Cindy. It was great to chat today. You as well. Thank you, Bronwyn. All right. Bye. Bye.